you should see the title screen for Job Search for Over 50, brought to you by the Addison Public Library and myself, Bruce Bennett. And um, we've got a lot of information to share with you tonight. And um, afterwards, um, Matt will be making the recording available. Uh, I will also be making the uh, presentation deck available to him as well, because there are a number of hyperlinks to different articles and videos and such. Um, I'm not playing every link that's in the in the presentation tonight, but they'll be there uh, for your use uh, later on after the event. So let's get started. So as an introduction, I think it's best for me to talk about that I have do most of my work with the McHenry County Workforce Network. I've been a volunteer there since 2010. Um, and in the last several years have started being a contractor for them, uh, producing and conducting the Internet Job Seeker series, which is a four part module. I'll have a little bit more on that later. Uh, at that same time in 2010, I started attending the Harper College Career Stimulus Program. It was a monthly networking event. Uh, and at one point, uh, the LinkedIn breakout session person got a job. So they needed somebody to do their LinkedIn breakout session. So I started doing that. So that led to two and a half years of doing regular LinkedIn classes for Harper College. So that's kind of a little bit of my background. I have a blog. Uh, I also do these presentations at other job clubs and other library groups as well. Several years ago, Bruce Bixler, uh, a person that I connected with at the Harper College Career Stimulus, uh, he and I have collaborated quite a bit. We've actually conducted training classes together uh, and such. Uh, we decided to put out a podcast about LinkedIn. So we started producing B Squared Discuss LinkedIn. Uh, and we put out episodes that are relatively short, 10 to maybe 20 minutes. So it's an easy listen. It's not like you have to invest an hour's time uh, and such. So those are available on your favorite podcast provider. Now, just some general notes for today. Uh, my contact information is on the last slide. And this is interactive. So if all of a sudden you have a question... Feel free to unmute and ask away. Um, I prefer to take questions as they come up rather than try to recapture uh, what we were talking about 30 minutes ago and such. So uh, also, this is a place that you could probably share some experiences. I would venture to guess you all have some that are relevant to job search. I think one of the main things that you really need to understand, though, is that age discrimination happens all the time, and it's not always easy to recognize it. And that lends us into our first video that we'll be watching. And let's give a listen to people over 40 denied free sale. Welcome to Basketacular. Today we're giving away free gifts. When were you born? How old were you? This is over 40, and that's the under 40 line. Hold on, I have another preferred customer. Hello, how are you? She's preferred. How come I'm not preferred? Oh. Welcome to Basketacular. I've got to run a maze to get up here. So, can you use the tablet and just fill out your email just for feedback? Sure. Your generation probably doesn't know how to use the tablet, so I'm just going to get oh, you a pad of paper. <laughs> You know what I do for a living? I'm a programmer. I know more oh about my apps gosh. than you do by a long shot. That's kind of judgmental. So I may be your perfect customer. We're just not prepared to offer you gift That's baskets fine. at the price point you're looking for. You don't even know the price point I'm looking for. I mean, I can yeah. assume that you're going to be expensive. I would never count out a customer. I get the age discrimination a lot. I'm unemployed right now looking for a job. I was laid off when I was 60 years old, and I've been basically told time and time again, you wouldn't fit in with our team. I'm always judged more for my age than my resume. I'm just gonna create this barrier right here. Okay, so just stay right there. I'm just gonna create a barrier here, and we're gonna get you guys right through. Why did you we have hand off? in a different section. Just because you guys are exactly what we're looking for. Young, fresh, digital natives. I don't think I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you for your time. 
<laughs> discrimination is discrimination. Doesn't matter if it's based on age, sex, or race. I'm glad that ageism is being recognized. I think our workplaces thrive when you have mixes of ages. The truth is, we can do anything. <laughs> We've been through it all. So it's it's that simple um, that it can be very blatant uh, in other cases and situations. It may be uh, less obvious. An outline for tonight is really we're going to talk about the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and then we'll we'll look at recognizing age discrimination. And we kind of saw that to a certain extent with this one video. Uh, there's another video that I'm not going to play, but it's the same kind of venue, uh, except it's a food truck. They're only serving under 40s uh, individuals. We'll go through several different websites that are really geared, geared towards helping the mature worker. Um, and along with that, there's also a couple of, of those websites that have identified worker-friendly uh, companies that are are geared towards the more mature worker. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time on overcoming objections and stereotypes. Um, there is a video I'll be playing from Professor Heather Austin uh, that talks about uh, five steps to really overcome the stereotypes. I think it's a great listen. Um, and actually, I had a hyperlink for two of our videos, uh, one's about 10 minutes and the other one's about seven and a half. And uh, they, they're they different format, same subject matter exactly. Uh, and I decided to keep the newer one, which is uh, only the seven and a half minutes. Now, the other thing too, about looking for work when you're more mature is networking. 65 to 90% of the jobs are estimated to be found through networking. So that's an integral part of the job search process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and positioning yourself. And then I'm going to kind of wrap up with some suggested actions. Now, the Age Discrimination Employment Act, um, you know, it was done in 1967, protects certain applicants and employees 40 years of age and older. Um, so Paul Cameron, who is a recruiter in the Western Burbs, he's uh, an IT recruiter, um, he talks about age discrimination and the act in his video. Uh, we're just going to play a few minutes of it because uh, it's about 15 minutes long, we usually do about three or four minutes. Let's give it a listen. In my interview strategies audio training program, which is called turning interviews into offers through advanced selling techniques, I have a section on this topic that covers oh. just about all the different types of illegal dis Let's start at the beginning. Are you concerned about being discriminated against? Listen, I have great news for you. The Federal Age Discrimination and Employment Act of 1967, which was amended in 1986 and most recently in 1991, makes it illegal to discriminate on the basis of age against anyone over the age of 40 years old, which is great news because now we can all feel really confident that age discrimination never happens anymore. I mean, what a relief. Okay, yeah, maybe not. And you know what, here's a couple more laws that you really need to know about, and then we'll talk about how to handle these types of situations. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 makes it illegal for any employer with more than 15 employees that engages in interstate commerce and any employment agency, for that matter, regardless of size, if they have clients larger than 15 employees that engage in interstate commerce, this act applies directly to them as well. It's illegal for any of them to discriminate against any individual on the basis of that individual's race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. The Americans with Disabilities Act became effective in 1992, which also covers employees with 15 or more employees in all employment agencies. The ADA defines someone as being disabled if they have a physical or mental impairment 
and a substantial limitation on a major life activity. And from there, the act gets very specific and there's multiple exceptions and differences that truly needs to be studied to be understood. For example, you know, if you can't read, well, that's a physical impairment that results in a substantial limitation on a major life activity. But if you can't read because you dropped out of school before you learned how to read, well, then you're not technically impaired, which means you're not disabled. But if you can't read because you have severe dyslexia, well, then you meet both requirements of being both impaired and having a substantial limitation, and you are considered to be disabled. Or, for example, if you are currently engaging in the illegal use of drugs, well, then you're not considered to be disabled. But if you're a rehabilitated drug addict, not currently using illegal drugs, or people participating in supervised rehabilitation programs no longer using such drugs, well, you can be considered disabled under the act and you may not be discriminated against. So if you think you could be considered disabled for any reason, but you're not sure you're covered by the act, read through the Americans with Disabilities Act effective as of July 26th, 1992 to determine if you are disabled. In my Interview Strategies audio training program, which is called Turning Interviews into Offers Through Advanced Selling Techniques, I have a section on this topic that covers just about all the different types of illegal discrimination that can happen. The laws that can protect you, the questions that are being asked during interviews that are illegal, why they're illegal, how to respond, and I've included that track from my audio program here on this page for free. Now, if you're already a member and you're logged in, you can just click on the link that's here on this page to download that, or you can just listen right where you are. If you're not a member, just fill out the quick form on this page, and I'll send a, I'll send a link to you to get to that track. Now, my goal here in this video session really is just to focus on one type of discrimination, age discrimination. And really, the way you handle this can be applied to the other types of discrimination as well. But my focus here is going to be on age, since that one's the most common of all the questions that I hear at the live job search seminars that I do on a monthly basis in the Chicago area. Okay, so I think we'll stop it there. Uh, that pretty much sums up the introduction of the act and stuff. Um, you know, in, in age discrimination can happen randomly, and it doesn't happen all the time. So sometimes it's more likely to be subtle. Um, there's a hyperlink here, an experiment that's very similar to the basket one, except now the, the venue is a food truck. And so if you're over 40, uh, they don't want to sell you the sandwich. Uh, again, it's kind of uh, strange and, and wonky to go through that kind of process. But I, I'm sure if you're, you've been in the job search mode and you're over 40, there's probably been uh, an instance or two of discrimination. Uh, several years ago, um, I was interviewing for a position that was data collection, intercept. Well, gosh, my, my background is in media and marketing research, uh, initially doing uh, Nielsen TV ratings and then other in-person uh, intercepts and such. And so I was really surprised when I went for the interview and then they said, well, we'd like to see you in action. So can you come to one of our venues and work for a couple of hours? And of course, it was unpaid work. But I did go do, do that. And uh, it seemed to work just fine. Didn't have any issues uh, intercepting people and getting them to take part in the survey that they wanted uh, done. Um, but I never got a job with them. I was really surprised. And then I learned that one of their employees, who is the one that connected me to the opportunity, she heard from the big cheese. Nah, he's too old. We don't want him. So it does happen. Even though I had the credentials, it was probably an ideal candidate and probably overqualified. It the thing that you need to keep in mind, too, is that it's not just the more mature worker that you're too old for the role. It also happens in reverse where you're too young for the role. That young college graduate may not have any experience 
And a lot of companies will look to have at least a couple of years of experience under their belt. So it, it works in both areas of matriculation through the workforce. Now, a lot of times it may happen through layoffs. Company has a big layoff and gosh, more of the people who are gone are the more senior individuals. And sometimes it may be simple, as simple as more restructuring the team or your job's been eliminated um, and such. In some cases, companies will even offer early retirement, giving you a combination of, you know, years of investment, um, years of um, benefits, uh, several different criteria could go to that. But they make it the early retirement package so sweet that you can't refuse it. As an example, my, my father-in-law worked for Illinois Bell for years, uh, which was really a subsidiary of at and I believe, at that time. And uh, after working there for 40 years, he was in his late 50s. They said, well, you know, you can retire now. We'll, we'll pay for all your health care uh, and stuff like that until you reach 65, blah, blah, blah. And it was literally an offer he couldn't refuse. Uh, and I know that uh, subsequently, just even the last year or two, I've, I've worked with somebody who was from AT&T. And again, they were offered the early retirement uh, and stuff. It, it could be bland, and they might just say you're too old for the job. Or you might even hear about new system coming into the uh, office or the corporation, and they don't want to bother training you on this new system because you're about ready to retire. You're near that age, right? Now, companies have always got some method to their madness. And one of the reasons that age discrimination takes place is that their insurance costs do rise as workers get older and older. I mean, it's not a, a shocker that as you age, you run into more medical conditions which again increases expenses and such. You know, being asked, how long do you plan to work uh, really is another key to there's age discrimination coming about if they're asking you that. And it's not uncommon to run into that in an interview uh, and such. Sometimes companies have the, the thought process of, Oh, this, this person's worked at the same company for 30 years. Look at all the bad habits we're going to have to unlearn that individual so that they can work within our system. And of course, the one that I take the most umbrage at is that boomers don't know new technology. And as we saw in that one video, the one uh, older guy who was um, in IT had been working with uh, computers for 40 years uh, and such. So I think that's a misnomer when we're identified as not knowing uh, new technology. Any questions so far? Okay. The Chicago Tribune had an article a few years ago, Thrive Past 45, and this is an actual hyperlink to the article so that you can uh, review it uh, after you receive the deck from Matt. But there's a lot of good advice in there because, again, it's like just because we turn 40 or we turn 50, life doesn't stop. We still have to keep on going. Um, and part of the thing is owning and recognizing what you can really bring to the table. And once you hit that, that miracle number of 40 or 45 or 50, it's important to keep in mind these concepts. You've got a lot of experience. You've been working for a decade or a couple of decades. So you want to really promote it and use it. Um, it may be a solution. In other words, uh, 
on occasion when I do my um, webinar on Guide to a Winning Interview, I'll talk about a pain cover letter. And that's where an individual has a similar experience, identifies a company that they're applying to and what their pain point is now uh, and such. And you've got the experience to help alleviate that pain. Now, another key area for us is networking. Uh, many companies now have employee referral uh, bonuses to help develop talent for their organization. So anytime that you can get an employee to sponsor you to HR, definitely put you into a very positive light. Now, again, we've worked for a decade or two decades, sometimes even three, and, and we've tended to stick in one place. You know, nowadays it's shifting where uh, the newer generations tend to uh, bounce around a little bit more. But we've typically in the past been more loyal and stayed at a company that were committed to some of the values and the company, the brand, if you will, and some of the products or projects that they, they do. We also bring a certain amount of openness. We, we are really tech savvy and we're ready to learn new things. Um, I think when you are ready to stop learning, you've actually been planted six feet under. Uh, so until that day, you're gonna be learning something new almost daily. And an, another thing that we as mature workers bring is a better perspective. We think of obstacles and challenges, not problems and issues, things that we can overcome uh, and such, and not wringing our hands about, oh, this is a mess and we're not going to be able to fix it. We'll roll up our shirt sleeves and get to it. Now, the one individual that's quoted in the article is Don Blackwell, and he really emphasizes our ability to focus, that we can really zone in and avoid those distractions. And we've seen a lot of this in the last four years post-COVID. People tended to work harder at home than they did in the office more effectively because there wasn't the meetings at the water cooler. There wasn't this distraction. There wasn't that distraction that, you know, sidetracks you. Yes, there are some individuals that probably did their laundry or, you know, emptied the dishwasher or something while they were working. But for the most part, the companies benefited from working from home because people didn't have to catch the 545 train to get home. They simply just kept working. And then it was like, oh, 630, maybe it's time to go ahead and fix some dinner. Another element that works in our favor is our communication style, that we prefer the personal touch. You know, an example is like uh, a millennial might want to text somebody but as a boomer or more mature worker, we're probably more likely to get up and walk down the hall to talk to the individual rather than respond to their email or text them back. Another area that we're known for is our flexibility. You need me to come in at eight? I can come in at eight. We're, we're not regimented to a nine to five type role. And of course, with our experience comes a certain amount of confidence. I can do that. And again, go back to the first bullet to talk about all that experience that we've dealt with over the years. Now, we're going to go through a series of different websites. Again, you'll have access to this deck so that you'll have um, these hyperlinks and such. But all of these gold um will be hyperlinks. And here's one, Career One Stop. Um, and 
it's really geared towards 55 plus workers here at this particular section, you know, uh, beat the bias, explore a new career, self-employment, boost your skills. So it has a lot of information here um, for the more mature worker. You won't hear me use the O word very often. No presentation on mature workers would be complete without a reference to AARP. Um, it is a benefit to join them. You can think of it as a big networking group. It's also an advocacy group for your age group. Um, and I think they are very influential uh, and such uh, in a governmental role or advocacy or what would you call those guys? Um, and I used to work with them. The, um, not the labelists. Matt, help me out here. Um, the lobbyist, that's it, the lobbyist. Those lobbyists that are looking to raise pharmaceutical prices or those things, this organization can definitely uh, be an advocate for you and uh, your group. But they have, again, uh, a section for the mature worker uh, and such. Another one here is the Workforce 50. And um, I'll share a couple of screenshots here. And of course, here you can just see jobs, job seeker, and the Workforce 50 library. So there's a lot of different resources here uh, and such. And here you can see there are employers seeking older workers. Um, and you can generally go in and search uh, specifically for those. Uh, another website is retirementjobs.com. And again, here we'll help you beat age bias. And this is one of those organizations too that also has certified age-friendly employers where companies have actually signed on to hire more mature workers. Again, here's a agefriendly.org, same kind of thing. Here you can find jobs for the more mature worker. And then here is the Certified Age-Friendly Employer Program. Now, this has been in place for several years now. And when we scroll on down the page, it literally lists a lot of different companies here. Uh, and as you can see up here at the top of this column, it's Two Life Communities. Well, the next column is Fresh Market. So you've got A through E, maybe even F in this first column. So there are a lot of employers here that recognize the value of a mature individual and such. Now, along with that line, AARP has a similar uh, style of organization where they have employers who have pledged to hire people. Um, and here you can actually search by a company name or bios by location, uh, and you can select Illinois, uh, Chicagoland area and stuff. And of course, if you select Chicagoland, I think Ace Hardware will be up uh, first on the list. Maybe not. It looks like there's several companies here that have uh, numeric starts. Now, this is probably going to be one of the most important videos for today. And it's really about how to fight ageism in your job search. And that's a hyperlink. But if we kind of recapsulate Professor Heather Austin's points, it's really focusing on your relevant experience. You know, if you worked at a company from 90 to 2002, that might be relevant, but more likely than not, it's not relevant to your current role or what you're seeking. So it's got to come off the resume. You know, in, in a course with your resume and your interviewing, 
it's really knowing about what you bring to the table, what sets you apart from everyone else, um, and that makes a difference uh, in being able to articulate it on paper or in an interview. But identifying it and knowing it and then being able to talk about it can really be helpful. And of course, uh, I already talked about learning as a, a lifelong process. Um, and if you're in a career transition or career break, now's the time to really start looking to develop those skills that you always wanted to. Maybe you don't know PowerPoint. You always thought you could. Uh, I'm sure um, the library has a couple of courses on that. Uh, your local community college, even the local senior center, which you may not be eligible for yet, uh, probably has stuff like that too as well. But always continue to learn about life, industry, skills, technology, and I've got one tip uh, at the end uh, in regards to that. Now, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you don't need to have one, but it is another arsenal um, in your job search. And a LinkedIn profile can be very impactful uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but if you don't have one, Create one, and if you have one, use it and engage with companies that you'd ideally like to work for. That's one of the critical aspects um, of finding a job is being out there on social media and letting employers know that you're out there. And ideally, you've got some recommendations or other uh, words from some of your former colleagues and such that you know, really kind of justify uh, your strength as an employee. And of course, the last little bullet point that you really talks about is networking like you've never networked before. Again, you know, a majority of the positions that people land are through networking. So I've kind of given an overview with the, the video, but let's give a, a listen to Professor Heather Austin now. Unfortunately, age discrimination is alive and well in today's workforce. Whether you feel like you're too young or you're too old, your age can play a big part in your job search no matter how you market yourself. Now, regardless of your situation, today we're going to cover five strategies to help you overcome the effects of ageism so you can get hired. And hey, if you want a killer resume, one that lands you more interviews and better job offers, stick around until the end to learn where you can grab my free resume training course. It gives you a simple step-by-step -step formula to make your resume stand out and beat the competition. I'm Heather, a career strategy expert, helping you land your next big career opportunity so you can grow in a field you love. If you've not yet done so, click the subscribe button down below. And if you're excited about today's topic, hit the like button while you're at it. Now, before we jump into the five steps to help you overcome age discrimination, remember that your job search priority should be to use your cover letter, your resume, and even your LinkedIn profile to make a strong case that you're the perfect fit for the position no matter your age. And here's the thing, if your age, either young or old, does play a part in the process, you wanna portray it as a strength, not a weakness. Now, tell me in the comments down below if you've ever been concerned about your age in the job search before. All right, let's dive in. The first step to overcome age discrimination in your job search is to focus on relevant experience. Your career portfolio, which includes your resume, your cover letter, and your LinkedIn profile are not meant to show everything you've done in your entire career. Instead, these items should showcase your skills, talents, work history, and even your education as they relate to the job you're applying for. Think about what it is that makes you qualified. What skills or experience make you a good fit? Whatever's not relevant to the position, you wanna leave it off of your resume, your cover letter, and your LinkedIn profile, and you probably don't even wanna mention unrelated work experience in your interview. If you're a bit older and concerned about ageism, I have some good news for you. You can omit details that date you. For example, eliminate jobs that are 10 to 15 years or older and leave off 
off graduation and school dates. Now, what if you're on the other end of the spectrum and you worry that you're too young? If this is the case and you're just starting out and feeling like you're lacking in experience, go out and get some. Volunteer for companies and positions and in industries you'd like to work for. Look for internships and find new connections to help you begin to build yourself professionally. And in time, you'll be able to build the groundwork for your career. The second step to overcome ageism in your job search is to show how you're unique. By showcasing how you're uniquely qualified to serve in a role, you can make age less of an issue. What can you offer an organization that no one else can? What training or experience do you have that can be an asset to your future employer? If you're struggling with this part, think back to some of your greatest achievements. Anything with measurable outcomes works great. Things like boosted revenue, decreased costs, improved workflows. These are all great examples of key accomplishments that you can mention. Also, think back on praise you've received from your coworkers or your boss, positive feedback that you may have received in quarterly reviews, and anything else that speaks to your strengths. Work to develop many career stories around your greatest accomplishments that tell what the problem was, what action you took to solve it, and what the results were. Hey, and do me a favor if you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to hit the thumbs up button down below. It tells me that I should create more videos just like this for you. Step number three to overcome ageism in your job search is to always be learning. Employers love when job seekers are adaptable and able to change with the times. So you want to keep up to date with what's happening in your industry. Try to get current with any special job certifications that may have expired and look into your online courses to brush up on your skills. Look into joining professional memberships or groups to keep your knowledge fresh. By showing that you are continually learning, employers will know that you're open to change and aren't stuck in your ways. Step number four to overcome age discrimination in your job search is to build a strong LinkedIn profile. Now I say this a lot on this channel because it's one of the most important steps you can take right now. Your LinkedIn profile is a key piece to your career portfolio. It can literally mean the difference between you landing a position that doubles your salary and you being stuck in a dead end job. It serves as your online resume and it helps you grow your brand, connect with others and attract new opportunities. Now for more seasoned professionals, using LinkedIn also shows that you're not afraid to use technology. Keep in mind almost 90% of companies use LinkedIn to post jobs and find candidates so you can't afford to miss out. You wanna have a fully optimized profile with strong keywords and titles that show who you are professionally. And if you're new to LinkedIn or aren't sure where to start, I've got you covered. I have the perfect video that will walk you step by step through optimizing the most important sections of your LinkedIn profile. I'll link the video below. Now, once your profile is complete, don't stop there. You need to start connecting with former colleagues, like and comment on posts related to your industry, and even post your own original content to show your part of the professional conversation. Keep in mind that recruiters and employers can see your LinkedIn activity and they're very impressed with job seekers who are active on the platform. Whether you're a baby boomer, a Gen X, or a millennial, once you get plugged in to LinkedIn and start taking it seriously, job opportunities start coming up. Now tell me in the comments down below, on a scale of one to 10, how active are you on LinkedIn? 10 being you post frequently, almost daily, one being you've never posted on LinkedIn. Now the fifth step to overcome age discrimination in your job search is to network, network, network. You need to network like you've never networked before. Networking is by far the most effective way to land a new job. In fact, CareerBuilder reported that 82% of employers prefer to hire through referrals because it has the best return on their investment. It saves them time, it costs them less money, and it helps them reduce employee turnover. All of this means that you need to take networking seriously. Think of networking like building relationships. It's about finding new connections and leveraging the ones you already have for opportunities to help you find your next position. You wanna start by making phone calls, sending emails or messages to some of your friends and acquaintances and letting them know that you're on the job search. LinkedIn is a great tool to help you begin networking with people you've never met before. I always suggest to my clients and my students that they search for a company that they'd like to work for, then find someone who works there to connect with. Now don't bombard them with questions or send your resume right away. Just open the conversation to start. Send a personalized note with your connection request to increase your chances for success. Now here's a quick example. Hi Mary, I see that you are a senior data analyst at company XYZ. I admire the vision of this organization and the work you are doing. I'd love the opportunity to connect with you here on LinkedIn. Sincerely, and then sign your name. 
The goal is to start the conversation and then kindly ask that person to help you get in touch with a hiring official. Now click or tap the video right here to learn more ways on how to use LinkedIn to network and skyrocket your job search. And if you like this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up button down below. Be sure to subscribe to this channel for more videos like this and I'll see you in the next video. Now we'll skip the rest because it breaks down into a little bit more of a commercial for her. But she is very prolific with a lot of different content that is good out there. Uh, another individual that I haven't got in this particular uh, presentation is Andy LaCivita. Again, he's out there in the Chicago area and is very prolific with a lot of advice for job search. Now, one thing that she mentioned, in, and it stuck out like a sore thumb, is she referenced, if you're a seasoned individual, well, wait a minute, that, you're not a roast. You don't get salt and peppered uh, after having a job for a while. So drop that seasoned uh, adverb um, or adjective uh, on your resume or your LinkedIn profile if it's there. Uh, it's one of those little irks that uh, I, I developed is seen seasoned too often on resumes. Now, John Jennings raised a good point. Um, he was one of the uh, principals for the St. Joe's Employment Ministry up in Libertyville that ran for almost 19 years. They just closed their doors this summer. Uh, really hard to see that, but understand but John said networking seems to be a crucial backdoor when you may get filtered out at the applicant tracking system front door. And, and boy, words were never truer for that. So whether you have a Rolodex or you've got LinkedIn or maybe a little black book, use those networking connections as an advocacy group. Uh, you definitely want to network with people um, by phone, in person, uh, emails, even text if, if you're real familiar with them. But it's really putting the social back into social media that's important during the job search process. You can send well wishes or brief notes. Um, maybe they've hit a milestone at their company. They've been there for 10 years. Uh, maybe they're celebrating an anniversary or a birthday. Uh, any number of things. And of course, we're coming up to that time of year in another month or two when networking becomes even easier. It's the holiday season. Uh, and so that really gives you an opportunity to send some good wishes and such uh, unannounced. You know, and, and again, meeting with people, uh, putting that social back into the social media aspect, uh, setting up a, a coffee break, uh, and primarily closer to them so that they don't have to be inconvenienced at all. Uh, none of this meeting halfway and type stuff. I can meet you near your office. There's a Starbucks right around the corner. Um, but, and, and don't be focused on asking them for a job or asking them for help, but focus on enjoying getting together and building that relationship. Now, if it's a, a new person that you're dealing with, somebody that you're trying to get more information about the company, or maybe even potentially have them uh, submit your resume to HR, you can, you can kind of ask for an informational interview, although that phrase has always left me cold. I prefer to think about you know, I'd like to learn more about what you do at your company and how your company has been so successful rather than just saying, I'd like to do an informational interview with you. So it's all in how you say it too. Now, there is a, a process to the job search. And I think this article here refers it really well. You need to identify your targets. Who would you ideally like to work for? Uh, if you're just applying willy-nilly to companies, I think you're less likely to uh, land a job than if you focus on specific companies 
and positions. So it's not just a company. You also need to focus in on a position. Just recently, I, I talked to somebody who had opened to work on their LinkedIn profile, and they had five different job titles that all seemed totally different. And it's like, well, what are you really going for? So once you've identified your targets, job position, and company or companies, have you got the marketing materials? Do you have your resume? Do you have a LinkedIn profile? Do you have a networking pitch? Or even a tell me about yourself response? What about a cover letter for applying? Those are marketing materials and again are tools in that arsenal of the job search that you have. And of course, maybe researching the companies and industries, um, you know, think of it like coal versus electrical uh, battery driven vehicles. I mean, we're, we've gone, you know, 180 degrees in our technology uh, and such is, you know, some of the newer companies that are just coming out uh, a way to go and get in um, and such. Again, networking and interviewing with individuals who are at companies that you want to work at uh, or friends. But it's important to set aside time to, to provide structure for your day and stay motivated. Um, you know, many times I hear, well, gosh, looking for a, a job is a full-time job. It can be. Um but it's important to also step back and take some me time as well. But, you know, it really is a case of being organized and providing structure, still getting up at, you know, in the morning and going into the office and reviewing uh, new job postings or uh, sending out a couple of uh, notes to some of the people that you wanted to network with this week. But set goals for yourself and also Part of the process of job search is troubleshooting regularly. And it starts with your resume. You're handing out your resume, you're sending it off. First troubleshooting question is, are you getting callbacks? If you are, that's great. If you're not, there's something wrong with the resume. Maybe you need to change it up. Same thing applies with, you're getting those callbacks. You get a lot of callbacks, but you're not getting invited to the dance, that face-to-face -face interview. Well, what is it that you might be saying during that pre-screen phone call or that you're not saying that's causing that? So you'd have to really troubleshoot where that roadblock is happening and identify the problem and correct it. Till ultimately you're given a job offer and you negotiate and then close the offer and accept the position. Now, the job search process is really positioning yourself, knowing yourself, and what do you bring to the table? I always encourage my clients to inventory their skills. Like if you're on LinkedIn, you can list up to 100 skills. Well, you probably have more than that, actually. But a lot of times people think, oh, I've got 10, 15 skills. But when you start writing them out, there's a lot more. So know what they are. And then once you've identified all of your skills, what are the key elements or strengths that you possess? And I typically advise to have at least five strengths and a story that will illustrate to the interviewer that strength, rather than just say, oh, well, customer service is my uh, greatest strength. Have a story that illustrates that to the interviewer. So you want to be prepared to provide a narrative example. Give them a good story. Um, and of course, for interviewing, practice those stories, practice those responses uh, and such. And a lot of times, 
you know, I mentioned a, a few minutes ago about the person who has like five different job titles he's, he's trying to apply for. Well, it's like, well, really know and understand the positions you're applying for. Does the job description match your skills? If it does, great. If it doesn't, is there something that you can uh, acquire, like some on-the-job training or some volunteer work to get you some additional learning in that particular area? Are you using the applicant tracking system simulators that can help you um, get past those applicant tracking system robots? Most of all, it really helps to have a positive mental attitude about the job search process. Um, you, you know, with interviewing, there are so many basic questions, um, but you should be prepared to answer a lot of them. Um, behavioral type questions are really popular now. Give us an example. Tell me about a time when you had to enforce a company policy you did not agree with. Give me an example of when you had to resolve a conflict. Well, those all are trying to understand how you reacted in the past to predict how you're going to respond in the future. Some of these, these other two questions, where you were, why were you let go at your last job or why were you fired, uh, is going to send uh, a shot of adrenaline pumping into your heart and throughout your system. But if you've prepared a proper response and have practiced it, it will be easy, easy to tell the interviewer why you were let go. And of course, a lot of times too, companies will say, well, where do you see yourself in five years? And they're looking at you with your gray hair and thinking that Clearwater Beach uh, uh, sunscreen. Well, that's not necessarily the case. And that's always a question you can turn around to, to them and say, where do you see the company growing during the next five years as well? But you definitely want to be practicing to answer these questions on a regular basis. And I don't necessarily mean just answer them in your mind, vocalize them so that you get that muscle memory built up, just like uh, Rizzo and standing at uh, the friendly confines and hitting a home run although I don't think he did that this, this past week uh, when he was uh, part of the visiting team. But he did, when he was there at Wrigley, hitting those home runs for us, it's not because he got lucky. He's practiced. He practiced and practiced and practiced so that it becomes automatic routine. And the same thing happens when you start answering questions that should be regular interview questions. Your lips, your vocal cords, your breathing, your mind, they're all functioning as one element. And you're much better prepared with muscle memory to answer those questions. And of course, when the interview was taking place and you've asked, answered all of their questions, you're going to be asked, yeah, you have any questions for us? And it's like, yeah, you better have them. And... The main thing is don't ask questions that are easily answered on their website. Be creative. Now, I talked about fine-tuning your resume a little bit, uh, but these four websites, the Professional Me, Cultivated Culture, SkillSinker, and JobScan, act much like an applicant tracking system uh, that a company has. Um, applicant tracking systems, there's probably over a couple hundred of them. Uh, most of the companies that are out there now are My Workday and Taleo. Those two companies hold the lion's share of market in the U.S. And, and what those applicant tracking systems do is they literally scan your resume, data mine it to see how well it matches the job description. So if the keywords in the job description are not on your resume, you're not likely to get a phone call. So you can use these four different websites to get an idea of how well you match a company's job posting. And it identifies those keywords missing from your resume 
that you can then strategically insert to your resume um, and make it a much better fit and more likely to get through the uh, ATS and actually have a human set of eyes look at your resume because you've met the criteria. This is a little video about how JobScan works. These all have their different systems. Uh, in my resume cover letters and applying online, I kind of explore each of these, show the different reports, talk about their different features and such. Um, but for that presentation, I used the same resume and the same job description against all four systems. And the scores varied from a low of 29 to a high of 51%. Well, 51% is great, but they ideally want you to be at like around 70 to 75%. So there's a lot of opportunity for me to improve. Now, here's a page that uh, I'm actually going to go back to the live world. This is kind of hidden. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, great. And if you're not, I think you could still probably get there to do this. But here's the hyperlink to the page. It's called LinkedIn's Career Explorer. And what it does is it identifies different areas or alternate job titles that might be appropriate given your skills. So let's scroll down. And as we scroll down, this is a really long page. You have a position and you have a lot of skills here. What are some positions that might feature those same skills? And of course, here you can see time management is highlighted. So the more matches that you have with skills, the more likely that you would be a good fit for this position. And so here's shared skills in your typical Venn diagram and stuff. And as you scroll through and get down towards the bottom here, we actually get to the exercise where you can say, okay, uh, let's say Chicago area. And instead of food server, let's say marketing. And here's a long list of different marketing positions. And let's just take marketing administrative assistant. So this is the, this is our job. And here you can see that there were six job matches in the U.S. for marketing administrative assistant. So the first one is really marketing assistant. And here you can see these different key skills that are an overlap, some skills that you might be able to build. And of course, here's find jobs on LinkedIn. Um, and of course, here we go on to other potential ones, administrative consultant, marketing specialist, marketing coordinator, and they all have relatively uh, usual match percentages here. And you can sort from high to low and stuff. But here, again, there's a hyperlink to find jobs on LinkedIn for marketing assistance or connections on LinkedIn that are marketing assistance. So this is a good page to explore alternate job titles for yourself. And again, this hyperlink will take you there uh, and such. Any questions? Here we've got the customer service specialist that um, customer experience manager. Uh, this is that slide that shows some of those positions. So here's what I would say is some suggested actions. Use the library to learn new skills. Uh, hopefully your library offers LinkedIn learning. There's a lot of information that can be gained from there. Uh, and I think that that's a vital part of the job search process is acquiring new skills or updating and refreshing some of your existing skills. Now, the second bullet point I think is really important. Uh, learn and adopt artificial intelligence. You know, uh, you might have heard it a lot more in the last 
decade or last couple of years. But when you think about it, artificial intelligence really started um, quite some time ago, back in the 50s. They started programming computers to play checkers. Well, that's that's artificial intelligence from the get-go. Um, you want to attend networking events and job fairs. Uh, like all of you who are there at the library in person, uh, you should probably spend a couple of minutes getting to know one another and maybe exchanging some contact information because you never know. One of those people may have a friend that works at a company that you really want to work for. Engage with your networks, family, friends, LinkedIn, Facebook, your neighborhood. Um, a year or so ago, one of my neighbors reached out to me and, and asked for help. And I was very readily helping her to find her new position and stuff. So one of the things you want to do too as well, or can do during your unemployment, is volunteer. Keep your skills fresh, if you will. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, I learned from the PATH group, and I can't remember who it was that said it, but drop the mouse, get out of the house. If, if you're spending eight hours a day on the computer applying for jobs and stuff, you're doing it wrong. You know, you can spend a few hours doing that, but you really want to engage with your network by phoning maybe a little emailing, meeting up in person, or having something to do and volunteering your time is a great way to do it. And, and last but not least, what will serve you the best is persistence and tenacity. And of course, we've got Bob the Builder over here who's doing great things. Bob the Builder is my nickname for my former neighbor. Uh, he really wanted to work at Ikea. And over the course of six months, he applied for several positions. He got interviews, but he never got the offer. Um, and finally, uh, he noticed a new position that was just posted for the Schaumburg store. And he called his contact back in uh, the home office in Pennsylvania someplace. And he said, well, gee, do, should I, can I apply for this? Or she said, oh, don't worry about it, Bob. Here, I'll put you down for the position. And within a couple of weeks, uh, he had his interview, his job offer, and you can go into the Schaumburg Ikea and say, hey, I, I need to see Bob the Builder. Uh, he won't look like that, but they will know who he is. Persistence and tenacity, they definitely pay off in the end. Now, here are some resources. Uh, these are most of the top uh, several are the ones that we looked at. Um, and, but here are a couple of other longer things uh, from J.T. O'Donnell, um, How to Beat Age Discrimination in 2020. Might be a little dated, but it's still relatively uh, important. Same thing with the podcast uh, that goes about a half hour, a little long. So I mentioned um, I do a lot of work with McHenry County Workforce Network. This is a hyperlink to their page. Here is a hyperlink to their brochure for October. Um, they do offer a lot of personalized job searches. Okay. And uh, whether you want a resume review, a mock interview, or a LinkedIn critique, they do all of that uh, as well. I'm the LinkedIn critique guy, by the way. Um, and then uh, on my own personal schedule, this is what's coming up uh, in October. Resume Covered Letters Applying Online, Guide for a Winning Interview, Network to Success Job Club. We'll be doing the same presentation, except it'll have a different name, Age Discrimination During Job Search. And then uh, in mid-October, two different LinkedIn workshops. And that's it. I'll throw it open for questions if anybody has any.